Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Welcome back to another session of our series, Morning Reflections on the 99 Names of Allah. Inshallah, today we'll be covering three names of Allah, three attributes of Al Hakam, uh, Al Hayy, and As Satir. Uh, these names have the meaning uh, of the judge, the final judge, the arbitrator, uh, of the most graceful and the most modest, and the one who is the concealer, the concealer of sins uh, and the concealer of faults. So inshallah, to begin with Al-Hakam, uh, in the Quran, it's related in Surah Al-Ma'idah that is there any better judge than God for those of firm faith? Uh, and uh, in the hadith of in Sunan Abi Daud, the Prophet looks up that indeed Allah is the arbitrator. Uh, the judge, al-hakam, and to Allah is judgment, and to Allah belongs judgment. So this root of al-hakam has this connotation of preventing uh, preventing um, or restraining, especially when it comes to harm or injustice or holding back that which may cause, uh, you know, any any kind of negativity or harm in that aspect. Um, and so we see words like hakim pertaining to ruler, hukam pertaining to justice, and hikmah pertaining to wisdom, all packed into the same root word. So when it, it only builds upon the meaning of what, what al-hakam is. Because again, when we translate these words to English, it doesn't do it justice because we have a connotation of what a judge is uh, in our society, in our context, and we just kind of tunnel vision it to where this is what a judge must be. But think about all the layers of complexity that these, uh, these not just these Arabic terms, but these attributes, these divine attributes of Allah have that, that's packed in. Um, this name has the meaning that Allah is ultimately the ultimate uh, arbitrator and judge whose rulings and decrees one cannot overturn, or there no, no one can overturn, but also no one can call them unjust, unfair, or uh, in a sense targeted that they are, uh, you know, they create injustice or oppression. Uh, we know that Allah uh, in, in Al-Hakam is a part of a, uh, a beautiful spectrum of names uh, that, that include uh, Al-Hakim, the most wise, include Al-Adl, the most just, include Al-Alim, the most knowledgeable. And these names are not to ever be divorced from one another. They're individual in their uniqueness and they uh, have their own uh, beautiful uh, you know, own, own beautiful kind of foundations and beautiful wisdoms that can be gleaned from them, but they operate in sync. Uh, they're never one out of the other. Allah always is one. Allah has this, uh, is this aspect of one, of wahid, of ahad, um, and is unique and one. And this is all works together in this aspect. And so when Allah does rule or decree, Allah does so with wisdom. Allah does so with uh, with justice, with uh, knowledge, with awareness, uh, and all of these different things, with mercy, with compassion, all built into this judge um, and this role of an arbitrator, uh, especially when carrying out judgment. And so uh, when, we, when we think about something uh, with respect to Allah and decree, we think about the divine decree, that Allah's qadr is something that uh, things have already been decreed. Things are already written down. The pens have been lifted and the ink is dry. And that uh, we sometimes think that, uh, you know, it doesn't make sense to us that what are we doing in this, in this life if things are already uh, decreed for us? Why should we do anything if we have a divine decree that tells us where we're going to go. But there's a wisdom in this. There's a wisdom in this that actually calls us to do much more when knowing that Allah has put this down uh, on, on the paper and has, has this dried and things will happen according to the decree. We look at the example of the Prophet Sallallahu someone who was deeply connected to Allah as the messenger of Allah, who knew and connected in the revelation and knew what the promise of Allah was to bring, to knew that he would ultimately triumph, that this religion of Islam would triumph, that the people who persecuted him would be those who would be side to side with him in prayer and submitting to Allah. But yet in knowing that, the Prophet still would take on endeavors, uh, despite knowing that uh, he would be successful in the end, inshallah, that uh, he would still have to do uh, and put in the work. So you look at him uh, in his most difficult time, when his wife Khadija died, when Abu Talib died, that rather than saying, okay, this has been enough, it's emotionally taxing, Allah, you've got, uh, you, this is, these are your people, I'm going to, I'll do what I can here, but you know, you're, you're, you're going to make them successful, so I'll just kind of sit back and relax. No, he climbed the mountain to the next city uh, in the mountain town of Taif, and he went to a city where he was humiliated where he was uh, trying to preach the message, but he was chased out. He was harassed. He was, um, you know, assaulted. 
and uh, a, a time he recalls with his wife Aisha that this was the most difficult time uh, in his life, the most difficult experience. Uh, and there's the ex example when Aisha sees him uh, praying and she says, why are you praying? Your feet are soul, like swollen, um, your feet are sore. Uh, and and why, why do you do this to yourself when you are the prophet of Allah? Well, you know what's promised for you. And she said, shall I not be a grateful servant? So at the least, uh, what, why should we do anything if there's a divine decree to at least be grateful that we've been given this opportunity to act on our will as much as it may seem that it's been decreed for us, that we still have the choice to act uh, in, in a way that Allah is pleased with. And so when we understand that Allah is al-hakam, it means that we still work with our limbs, that we still work with our minds, our bodies, our soul, um, and we uh, understand this basic truth at the end of the day, that despite doing all that effort, we still understand uh, in the back of our mind a basic truth, as the Prophet lifted up in the hadith, that know that if the whole world was to gather uh, together in order to help you, that they would not be able to do so except if Allah had written so. And if the whole world had gathered together to harm you, they wouldn't be able to do so unless Allah had written so. Uh, that the pens have been lifted and that the pages are dry. And we know that whatever Allah decrees ultimately, whatever is the divine decree will come to pass without a doubt. Um, but knowing that it's our responsibility to put in that effort and the outcome uh, is ultimately in Allah's hands should actually uh, give us a sense to lament things genuinely, to have that, uh, that sense of lament, to have that sense of divine complaint in a respectful way uh, with it, with modesty uh, and with connection, that things happen to us that might happen, especially outside of our control, um, that we may not be prepared for. But uh, we, we can't say that we expected these things, that, that we have that room to lament. Um, but it should be uh, of note that we can take these events as, a, as teaching moments and as ways to become better, to, to keep doing what we need to do, um, and, 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 and to see them not as uh, an end-all be-all, but to see that we still have efforts and still have a responsibility to act despite things have been ordained or preordained for us in that sense. And so this is part of as well of the, the submission aspect that Islam inherently has the root meaning of, of a submission uh, not to any one person or anything, but to Allah, uh, submission to Allah and to Allah's way uh, and to recognize that Allah's wisdom is underlined in all things, that Allah is in, uh, in, in the creation, in all of these things. And these are all reminders of Allah, uh, but the wisdom of Allah is in all things. And so part of believing in Allah's al-hakam is to know that Allah, uh, that faith, is, its fundamentals, its sacred texts, its beauty, its essence uh, are from Allah as the most wise, that Allah from the most just, and that uh, al-hakam will be the only one at the end of the line, at the day of judgment, who will judge us accordingly, fairly, uh, in, in, in respect to what we had experienced in the trials of this world, the sins that we committed, the sins we expiated, how we were in this world and how we were uh, with other people. Uh, Al-Hakam will be the one that sees everything as it is and to be able to judge with the fairest and wisest judgment and most equitable judgment. So when we think about this, we want to lift up that we be just to other people. We judge fairly with other people and with leniency and care just as we hope Allah does for us on the day of judgment. Um, and that we restrain ourselves when we're given this power of judgment, when we're given this power of authority, um, and we uh, restrain ourselves to first make sure that we judge ourselves accordingly. And then uh, in, in accordance when we judge for other people, we do so with our impartiality. And we do so with the fear of Allah, that Allah uh, help us in this aspect. And so we want to also lift up that this name should help us be rulers over our anger, over our inner desires, our lower temptations, uh, that anything that prevents us from being just being wise or being fair in our judgment, that which we uh, that which will inhibit us, we want to be free of. And so, uh, this is the name of Al Hakam, the name of uh, the names of Al Hayy and Al Satir, uh, names that have the meanings of the one that is the most modest and the uh, the one who's concealing the faults and the concealer of faults. Uh, we have Al Hayy, which is uh, a name that signals the opposite of insolence and impertinence. It's often hard to translate directly, uh, as we've talked about of Arabic words, uh, but it has many different words that come from its roots. The name of, or the, the term of haya, the concept of haya, 
comes from the same root, and we oftentimes translate it as shyness, but also timidity. Um, the, our book, uh, Reflecting on the Names of Allah by Janan Yusuf, uses uh, terms like graciousness and demure and uh, shy interchangeably, but notes that Allah's haya is from a place of honor, generosity, majesty, and not meekness or submissiveness, as we might oftentimes associate. It's not a shyness that causes us to curl up and not want to do anything. This is a shyness that uh, that, that, that shouldn't prevent you from doing what's right. It should call you to do what's right and what's just because you have a modesty out of Allah. There's a modesty that causes you to work actively rather than kind of go into your own world. Uh, and there's a hadith by the Prophet that says that be modest before Allah. Be modest before Allah as it is Allah's right. Uh, that modesty before Allah uh, is to guard the mind and what runs through it, to guard the stomach and what fills it, and to reflect upon death and trials. And whoever desires the hereafter, let them abandon the embellishment of this worldly life. And whoever do does so has been modest before Allah. So seeing the complex concept of modesty beyond just this aspect of shyness, we might define it to that haya has so much that is there and that verily Allah, uh, who is the one that is uh, generous uh, and shy, uh, seeks that for the servants as well. So this name is related to the name of as satir and the one who covers that. We'll, we'll speak to that in just a bit, but um, there's a hadith of the Prophet son that lifts up this very thing that verily Allah is the Almighty. And Allah the Almighty and Majestic is modest, is also concealing and concealing. And Allah loves modesty. And Allah loves concealment as related in Sunan Abi Da'ud. So Al-Hayi is the one who does not turn us away. Uh, the Prophet lifts up that verily your Lord is generous is and is shy. That if Allah, a servant, raises their hands to him in supplication, that Allah becomes shy to return them empty, to, to want to give something back out of this shyness, this mod modesty, um, which is related to intimacy. So think of all the cultural connotations when we have with respect to turning someone away when they come and ask for help. Um, you don't, you don't, uh, you, what's it called, if you don't have uh, what is needed, um, one with uh, with respect to what is needed, you see in our cultures of uh, whether it's it's you know outside of the normative culture, but oftentimes in uh, countries uh, with you know lower economic statuses in a sense or, or lower economic development, uh, countries that maybe are more rural, even parts of this country um, that are more hospitable or known for their hospitality, especially in uh, eastern countries that. Uh, if you don't have what's needed, if they don't have what's needed, if you come to them, they will find alternatives. They might connect you to other people. They may offer something else. They may cook you a meal and say, this is, this is an alternative, but they find other ways to do so. And that this is haya. This is shyness and modesty, but this is also karam. Uh, this is generosity. And Allah's haya, Allah's karam is far different because Allah does not turn you away when you ask. Allah not only finds alternatives, but Allah finds the solutions for you as well and opens different paths uh, in the sense and takes care of those who need Allah. Uh, Allah knows better for us that what is uh, best for us is given, gives us that which may need to be delayed or maybe in the future or maybe needed instantly. And there's a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that lifts up how Allah interacts with these prayers that uh, when Allah's generosity and modesty is, is enacted, that any person who supplicates to Allah in a way that doesn't sin, uh, have any sin in that or break kinship, Allah will give them one of three things that Allah will answer their prayer or Allah will delay it for them for the hereafter or Allah will turn away an equal amount of evil uh, with respect to that prayer. And so you see how Allah responds in different ways that this modesty is one that is active and it is one uh, that, that brings out um, different solutions for people depending on where they are and what's best for them. And knowing that Allah is Al-Hakim, Al-Alim, the one who is most wise, the one who is all-knowing. And in this name of As-Satir, we have the, uh, the name that conceals faults and shortcomings of those who come to Allah, uh, because Allah is, is the one who loves to conceal their fault, um, but al also Allah loves those who conceal the faults of others and fault and their own faults. It's part of hayat, not able to be detached from that. Uh, and in the root meaning of this has the connotation, not just of concealment, but concealing those faults repeatedly and with a quality. So not just doing it for show, but uh, concealing it out of a generosity and a genuineness. So we want to lift up these names to have hayat, 
uh, to have modesty, to conceal our sins and others, knowing that uh, Allah conceals our own. Um, there's a real important hadith of the Prophet ﷺ in which he lifts up that uh, Islam has, uh, you know, there's, there's all these different religions have their own definitive kind of mark. And the mark of Islam is modesty. Uh, the defining characteristic of Islam is modesty and haya. Um, and unfortunately, we oftentimes, as I mentioned, define this as shyness or meekness, uh, as opposed to dignified modesty. And we sometimes, uh, unfortunately, just label it for women or just give it as an expectation just for women and not for men, when this is something applicable to all believers, regardless of their gender or their difference. Um, so when we live with these names, we want to lift up that we don't expose people or make uh, make light of uh, their of, of not concealing their sins, uh, unless you know. Of course, this doesn't include in the instances when people harm other people, when people are threats or hurting other people. Uh, that's different, completely different circumstance. This is like if you have a brother or sister that uh, has another. Um, you know, has some habits or has some things that they're doing, you may see them do those. And then you go post on social media, say, hey, I just saw this person, like, what are they doing? That, that's not what's right. Um, you want to be shy and modest with Allah so that Allah will be shy and modest with you, as well as with people. You don't want to turn away people because Allah does not, uh, Allah will aid a servant so long as a servant aids their sibling, as the Prophet taught us. And we want to ask Allah for all of our needs. And we uh, lift up as the hadith says in the Prophet to ask Allah to cover our faults and to protect us from our anxieties so that we may do so as well for other people. Inshallah, we ask Allah to conceal our faults, to uh, allow us to uh, be uh, modest and incorporate modesty in our belief, in our actions, and to be modest with us, and to be uh, the most fair uh, judge for us on the day of judgment, and to allow us the opportunity to show up to judge uh, to day of judgment with heavy scales for that which is good, and to judge us with that fairness. Inshallah, we ask this uh, all from Allah, and until next time, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.